uh, or rather omega d is a form of degree form, uh, degree d on possible d-dimensional manifolds. And moreover, I want to assume that this is some characteristic class uh, such as, um, for example, product of uh, either Stiefel Whitney classes or Van Hagen classes. Uh, if you don't like this, uh, just pick your favorite um, uh, degree D uh, class. <coughs> and um, we know that integrating such classes, uh, characteristic classes of the tangent bundle of manifolds, we can obtain a lot of interesting invariants. For example, uh, P1 will give you a characteristic. It's uh, first point tracking classes of degree 4 by integrating that over um, over the four manifold, you get the signature of the four manifold. That's the famous Hurtzebrook signature theorem. And uh, similarly, you can obtain a lot of useful invariants from Stiefel Whitney classes and high degree Pentragian classes. So, what I want to say next is that given such a class of degree D, you can um, pick uh, some integer n, which is less than or equal to d, but interesting cases is one strictly less than d. And uh, also um, uh, pick some n-dimensional manifold. Natural notation for that would be m sub n. And then you can naturally construct um, a characteristic class uh, of degree uh, d minus n, if you take this uh, omega d and integrate it over m sub n. So that's uh, the operation which is known as uh, push forward or fiber integration. So, you need some mapping to L. Huh? You need some mapping to L. Yes. So, um, uh, what I mean is uh, the following. If you have uh, a manifold which is a product of uh, m sub n and uh, some sigma of dimension d minus n, then you have a natural mapping. And uh, in this case, if you think about this product as a trivial vibration, then uh, this integral is indeed uh, the fiber integration of this procedure. So hopefully this is not very surprising or mysterious. It's trivial. So you may ask, why am I telling you this? So <clears throat> the reason I'm telling you this is um, that vertex operator algebras that we discussed last time, uh, namely, we gave them a name at some point VOA of M4 is in a similar way uh, this is push forward or fiber integration uh, along M4 and I want to draw you parallel because in that case uh, little n would be equal to Four, so that would be for a four manifold. And uh, the way you should think about it is that uh, now you get a class that depends on choice of mn. That you can also integrate further if you want over some sigma of dimension d minus n. So this gadget, this vertex algebra, likewise depends itself on choice of mn. And then you can evaluate this. Uh, on any two-dimensional Riemann surface sigma. So vertex operator algebra, of course, is not just a specific number or vector space. It's a package. It's a package that allows you to compute lots of other things. And its a purpose in life is to compute lots of things on Riemann surface sigma. <coughs> so 
that's indeed quite accurate way of thinking about what this vertex algebra is. And it also suggests that um, the natural starting point for understanding where it comes from would actually be in six dimensions. Because if you think about the separation of fiber integration or uh, push forward, here we have a product of uh, M on which our characteristic class depends and uh, sigma on which we want to evaluate the result of, of this push forward procedure. So, so uh, d equals to 6? In this case, what we learn is that indeed uh, d equals, uh, this show what we should be thinking about is that d is equal to 2 plus 4, which is indeed 6. That's, that's absolutely correct. But let me continue with this a little bit slower. So that's indeed where we're going to land in a few minutes. But I want to reformulate this question about push forward the path integration in a slightly different language. So what is a pantragging class? Pantragging class is a simple way to define a TQFT. So by integrating that over d-dimensional manifold, we get some topological invariant. So that's what TQFT are supposed to do. So if I think about this guy as defining for me a d-dimensional TQFT, um, so which boards shall I use? Uh, I'm afraid that I'll run into this uh, boundary, so I'll, I'll write here. So TQFTD is something that can be evaluated on any d-dimensional manifold and gives you a topological invariant, a number, and you can think about this WDS as such a gadget. So then what I said here is that this push forward of fiber integration allows you to define a TQFT in dimension d minus n which also can be evaluated on any d minus n dimensional manifold and produce some useful or maybe less useful topological invariant by saying that if you have dot 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 here where you can put any d minus n dimensional manifold, you can take this dot 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 times m sub n and this is, this is your definition. So now I can put little dots here, meaning that I'm defining this TQFT of degree or dimension d minus n by such a trivial operation. <clears throat> I'm just rephrasing what's being said here, um, but uh, now it's getting us a little closer to where we need because what's interesting is that uh, now this TQFT in dimension d minus n, it actually uh, defined or it depends on your choice of m, on the manifold along which we integrate. So again, think about analogy. I'm bridging the gap between this vertex algebras, which are labeled by four manifolds, and TQFTs, which are labeled by four manifolds. Now, I can make another step, leap of faith, uh, which is now becoming, so until so far, it's a pure math. It's a, everything can be stated as a, as a theorem. So now I'm going to change it into less math and say, if you replace fiber integration by fiber path integration or functional integration. So functional or what's sometimes called path integration. Along this fiber M sub N gives you this statement that you can take some quantum field theory, which is defined by analog of this integration of a given D form. Uh, but now think about integrating, say, chern simons density of some gauge connection or some other primary or secondary characteristic class of a gauge bundle and integrating overall connections. So this will be a functional version of this fiber integration. So what it tells you is that there is a way to go from uh, QFT of dimension D to QFT to dimension D minus N. And physicists call this, and, and the resulting QFT will also depend on M. That statement will still hold. There is no surprise here. And physicists call this uh, procedure either Carlos Klein reduction, because these are the two guys who invented it. Um, or just dimensional reduction. And terminology is that you would say dimensional reduction on manifold M um, or uh, compactification.
In math, we often want to use word compactification when some moduli space is non-compact and we want to add some divisors at infinity to make things compact. This is very different and I have no idea why it's called this way, but who cares? So, <coughs> of course, uh, applied to some general nonsense QFT, this perhaps may or may not be a terribly useful statement, but when it's applied to TQFT, it's really is useful statement. So if I restore here T, then uh, this perhaps can be made into mathematical theorem one day. And um, what's interesting is that either TQFTs or QFTs in general exist only up to dimension six. So this procedure suggests that if you want to consider some interesting invariants of four manifolds or three manifolds, you should first find TQFT in some very high dimension and then consider such uh, interesting reduction. So they'll give you a big zoo of other TQFTs labeled by manifolds. But what's interesting is that uh, this dimension six that we already noted is uh, the limit. So quantum field theories are not defined uh, beyond dimension six. So that's that's the maximum where you can go. But some people are talking about eleven, no? Right, but these are not field theories. These are string theories. So indeed, uh, if you're willing to give up. Uh, that it's a quantum field theory and has to be a string theory, then you can go higher. But as far as QFT, uh, the statement for a folklore theorem is that uh, no either TQFT or QFT uh, for D greater than 6. But so, that's, that's the four is the upper bound. Uh, no, that's outdated. That probably goes back to 70s. <laughs> what QFT is defined in six dimensions? Huh? And what QFT is defined in six dimensions? Well, so in, Q, in six dimensions, there are quite a few interesting theories. So people construct them different, using different tools. Um, so that's, that would actually be a kind of separate subject, I guess, or separate talk. I don't want to, to talk about that. Um, but important point is that there exist uh, many, many theories, in fact, lots of them, among which uh, there are some theories which can be uh, made topological. So this requires some supersymmetry and additional ingredients. Uh, but what's interesting is that if you start in dimension six, which is the most kind of interesting uh, sky is the limit kind of thing, um, you cannot make them fully topological, even using all these ingredients that these theories possess. So you can make them topological only on four manifold at most. But this is cool, that's all we need. So, so far, we only were talking about four manifolds. So what you can do is you can take the six dimensional theory and try to put it, uh, so we start with six dimensions as we already anticipated, and put it on a four manifold cross some two dimensional manifold sigma. And the best you can do is you can make it fully topological along four manifold. and only uh, holomorphic along um, sigma. So you cannot get rid of all the coordinate dependence or metric dependence here, but you can kill uh, sort of Z bar part of the metric dependence. Moreover, these theories have interesting properties that um, there are not just um, random QFTs, uh, they're actually conformal. And so if you start in with a CFT, conformal field theory in dimension D, you can do this transgression, obtain CFT in lower dimension. And what this gives us, applied now to case where n is equal to four, so I'm really trying to bridge this gap and starting point is six. So we learned that we obtain a two dimensional uh, CFT which is labeled by choice of our four manifold, right? So <coughs> two-dimensional CFT that you obtain in this way, so that's indeed uh, the primary gadget that's relevant to, to our discussion. And it's, it's an actual physical theory. So as such, it has uh, it's not yet vertex operator algebra. So in Misha's lectures, he said that he is going to use CFT and vertex algebra meaning the same thing. Uh, for me, I definitely object that. It's, uh, it's not true. So two-dimensional CFT 
which we are trying to explore here. So I can now write that name. So this is the CFT is usually called T of L4. It has, uh, it's a physical, full interesting physical theory, kind of the one that you can observe in nature. Uh, in nature and it, it's, um, it has uh, two vertex algebras. So it has VOA on the left and VOA on the right, such that uh, they contain their own Virasora algebras. So here you have left copy of Virasora, and here you have some right copy of Virasora sitting inside. <coughs> In fact, uh, what happens is that if you follow this procedure, you find that the right-hand uh, side, this right sector, actually contains uh, n equals 2 super Virasora. So this is a bonus feature. In any case, you have two Virasoros. Uh, they have their own central charges, C left and C right. So it's not true about the right one, not about the left one? Yes. That's, uh, at what point did you break the symmetry with the right one? Um, at the point, actually already at the starting point. So this, um, the spinners in dimensions, uh, uh, say. No, not really. It's, it's actually a starting, it, it starts already uh, as a feature here. So this theory already breaks the symmetry between left and right. So there are spinners of definite chirality or, or sections of S plus S minus bundles on manifolds of dimension, say, 2 plus 4 times an integer. And here we're talking about 2 plus 4, and here we're talking just 2. And already as a starting point, this theory, which I used and didn't tell you much about, breaks the symmetry between left and right. So that was already asymmetric. And uh, reduction on a 4-manifold just inherits this property in some sense. So you're absolutely right that there are C left and C right. They, they don't have to be equal to each other. So these are completely, it looks like, two different sectors. So, <coughs> um, and therefore, in fact, you can, from this point of view, you can say that uh, if I want to associate to a four-manifold vertex separator algebra, you can actually make your choice. You can try to associate this one or this one. One of them is slightly more natural because, um, so the theories of this type that we discuss are two-dimensional theories, first of all, and notation is that they have this 0, 0,2 supersymmetry, meaning that there are non-supersymmetric, you have just Verasora on the left, and they have n equals 2 super Verasora on the right contained in your vertex algebra, so that's why people use notation 0, 0,2. So, <coughs> um, yeah. Um, you can pick uh, either of these vertex algebras as your VOA of M4, but one of them is more natural, and that's the left moving guy. Why? Because um, this uh, procedure of picking out, so here, as I said, from six dimensional point of view, the maximal kind of get, getting rid of the metric that can be done is making it fully topological along four dimensions and holomorphic along two dimensions. So this, corresponds to taking cuco homology with respect to supercharges that exist in this uh, super Virasora algebra. So it contains supercharge Q, so Q leaves in here, and therefore you can take cuco homology, and this is the object which is very nice to work with. In particular, last time we were computing um, or connecting Donaldson type invariants and uh, cyberquitan invariants and other invariants to vertex algebras. And um, the way they are defined, uh, cyberquitan invariants, Donaldson invariants, are also taking cuco homology. So that's the same cuco homology. Yeah, so I, I mean that uh, a priori it, it could, uh, yeah, so may, maybe it's something else. So uh, a priori it, it could depend on uh, Z and Z bar, so these are local coordinates. Um, say vertex operators, uh, so it can. But then, but it's not about dependence on the metric, this is about this kind of property of single relation functions, it's not about whether things depend, depend on the metric or not. Yeah, I think. It, it, 
Probably, yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't know what's the best way to phrase it, but it's uh, in general you would expect that various operators will depend on z and z bar. That's the general case. But if you kill this, then that's what I mean by making it holomorphic. And that's when you write the holomorphic on the left about M4. This is about being independent. Exactly, yeah. So topological here means that operator might depend on some vector or a bunch of coordinates on this M4, but uh, the fact that it's topological means that I can change x in any way and correlation functions will never depend on, on the difference. So here, they do not depend on z bar, but they still depend on z. So that uh, holomorphic, sometimes called holomorphic twist, is achieved by, by taking this Pico homology, which is only possible because in the right sector, because that's the only place where you have Q operator. Some supercharge such that Q square is equal to zero. Okay. So um, uh, left is Z and right is Z bar. That's correct. So, so. But correlation functions may still depend on both. So by separating, I mean that they can not really talk to each other in a meaningful way. For example, this could be a product of Z and Z bar. But if you really want to get rid of Z bar dependence, that's 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 what this uh, holomorphic twist achieves. Anyway, so. Uh, well, uh, at, at which point uh, we uh, uh, notice or uh, introduce uh, supersymmetry? Uh, um, yeah, so that was a property of this a starting point. So it's not just CFT, it's a supersymmetric CFT. Super CFT. And this one inherits this property. So supersymmetry is actually crucial to allowing you to make this theory topological. For example, if I started with the random choice of six-dimensional theories. Some of them are constructed and have less supersymmetry than required. Um, I wouldn't be able to put it on a general form manifold. But now I want to be able to put it on completely arbitrary form manifold. What is the number of supercharges? Uh, I personally like to count real supercharges or components of spinners. So total would be 16 in this counting. But the notation that people often use for the six-dimensional theory is, is also 0, 0,2. So that's another name for it. So this was like 20 minutes of uh, some physics, uh, or at least physics motivation, where, where this uh, vertex algebra comes from. So now I can just define uh, this VOA of M4. So this is definition to be the Q cohomology obtained from, from this physical theory. So the logical sequence that uh, that this uh, follows is, is not quite direct in the sense that uh, we don't just associate vertex algebra to a four manifold. We have this intermediate bus stop which starts with a four manifold and first goes to, to this physical uh, CFT, which is supersymmetric on the right, uh, called T of M4, and then we continue further and at this stage, that's where we take this Kuko homology and get corresponding vertex algebra, which is just holomorphic or left sector of that. So in some sense, uh, uh, this is obviously easier object to work with, but you should keep on the back of your mind that there is a full package of real two-dimensional CFT, including both left and right sectors, and they have to be glued. So that's real conformal theory. Uh, it pretty much is, because what happens if you take Yuko homology in pretty much all the examples you project to a ground state here. So that's, in, in that sense, it's, it's, it's really no mistake to think of this as, in fact, I don't know a single example. Well, maybe that's a lie, but anyway, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the left version. Okay, so uh, why am I telling you this? Because um, computing um, 
this VLA uh, the way we did last time. So you can think of it by studying moduli problems as, as, as we did uh, previously. Uh, but that's going to be hard. And on general four manifold, uh, you'll suffer a lot just to get answer for one specific four manifold. And again, uh, that's, that's really challenging, studying these moduli spaces. So roughly, this vertex algebra is supposed to be acting on moduli spaces of instantons or some other gadgets on a four manifold. But again, that, those moduli problems are really hard. So what this gives is gives you alternative access to this vertex algebra, so a complementary viewpoint. And uh, it allows you to produce uh, very quickly some of the structural properties and sometimes even general statements about uh, what you should expect. So first thing... Um, physics gives us the prediction of what about this vertex? Central charge? And uh, left central charge, right central charge? Uh, both. So, both, both. And probably something about primary fields and their conformal dimensions. Um, yes, that's, uh, that, that's, that's also true. Yeah. So I'll um, just focus on central charge for, for simplicity, because at some point I wanted to go to another subject. Um, but. As an example, indeed, of the data that, that Boris pointed out, in fact, a lot of things that I'm going to say is uh, based on our joint work. So, And uh, many things, if I say something wrong about vertex algebras later, I hope uh, he'll correct me, or many of you know the subject very well, so you'll correct me. Um, so, um, For instance, I indeed, uh, examples of the data that you can extract from this is um, central charges. And again, here you have to, uh, from the start, specify what your gauge group is. So examples that we considered last time were either SU2 or U1, as I try to uh, stay only with rank one cases uh, last time. So this was a billion case and still quite interesting. This is uh, first non-trivial non-abelian case. So uh, for instance, for SU2, uh, you find the following central charges. Your C left is equal to um, 13 chi plus uh, 18 sigma. And C right is uh, 3, sorry. Uh, 27 chi plus uh, 39 sigma divided by 2. Okay. Well, and uh, chi and uh, sigma uh, oh, and you introduced uh, the last time. Yeah, so chi is only characteristic of the four manifold. And sigma is a sigma signature of the four manifold, uh, just as last time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any any other questions? So in particular, you see they are not uh, equal at all. And um, and and this is supposed to be completely general formula that that physics tells you. It's derived. Um, using the assumption that holonomy of the four manifold is irreducible, so it's kind of generic manifold. If it has additional symmetries, then this derivation has some modification. But again, you can find it in the papers. Uh, but in general, that's supposed to, to be the, the formula. So, so manifold, manifold has to be generic. Yeah, manifold has to be generic, yes. Yeah, this also assumes M4 is compact. And actually, that's, uh, th th that's um, another general feature. So now you can basically start asking the following question. So suppose I have the world of four manifolds and world of vertex algebras. And you want to go connecting these two worlds back and forth. So <coughs> that's what we'll do in. Um, um, part of this uh, time. But 
you can ask uh, now what, what happens if it's compact. So far I was assuming that it's compact in order to do this. In fact, this formula is derived using uh, fiber integration of characteristic classes, exactly as I mentioned earlier. And it assumes for, for those integrals to be not so subtle uh, that manifold is compact. So general feature of uh, this VOA, as we already said earlier, you should think of it as, so VOA of this M4 is morally acting on cohomology, which is not correct, but you can replace it by K-theory to make it better. Or if you want to really make sense of it, you have to replace it by some fluoric homology of the moduli spaces of solutions to PDEs uh, similar to instanton equations. Okay, so <coughs> on, uh, on, on that M4, and when manifold is non-compact, what you should expect is that the solutions or instantons they can be parameterized by say points on this manifold. The moduli space itself is non-compact, so it definitely is going to be non-compact, and cohomology probably will be um, some funny or infinite dimensional. Um, even for, for finite dimensional moduli space, one is M is four is non-compact. So roughly what you should expect is that, again, this is kind of remark, which is uh, qualitative, that when M4 is non-compact, you should expect to find uh, your CFT or VOA non-compact. In a sense, uh, that it will be uh, more like Liouville theory or W algebra with a continuum spectrum of states. So non-compact means, if you think about non-compact target of, say, two-dimensional sigma model, non-compact means that you can have any momentum, basically. Think about uh, fields propagating on, on a non-compact space. And when M4 is compact, you should expect that your CFT or vertex algebra is compact. So more like, I don't know, minimal model or something like that. It doesn't have to be the case, so um, this may still be non-compact because of other sources of non-compactness, but if your manifold is non-compact, then definitely you, you should get something like legal. So this is kind of heuristic uh, picture that already is clear from this PDEs, even if we cannot solve them. But primary field related to cycles? So yes, with cycles of two cycles and uh, cycles of other dimensions. Yeah, so I won't go into this, I just want to play with this uh, central charges and give uh, simpler examples. Uh, yeah. So then one can try to start building this dictionary. Uh, and again, the idea would be that you first identify this VOA or CFT for simple manifolds and then start asking what does it mean to cut and glue things. So that's the game we're going to, to play. So let me make a simple table where I'll list different four manifolds and the corresponding values of C left and C right, uh, basically illustrating that formula so I can erase it later. So the simplest four manifold is a four sphere. And, um, uh, well, so what is the signature of a force here? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Uh, Euler characteristic. Okay, so very good. We got 26 on, on the left. So from the right, we got 27. <coughs> um, yeah, that's. Okay, so let, let's do the algebra together. <laughs> Yes, very good. So for CP2, that's more interesting example. Um, what is the signature? One. One. Uh, and early characteristic? OK, so we, we got that. So it gives 57 and, and 60. So CP2 bar, what's the signature? Somebody else should participate. OK, if nobody else knows, you can answer. <laughs> minus one. Thank you. So minus one, and the characteristic still three. So what we get here is 21 and 21. Kind of interesting that they happen to be equal. So let's do um, more like S2 cross S2. 
So signature. <laughs> yeah, you can go. Nobody else knows. <laughs> Zero. Zero, very good. And early characteristic? Uh, four. Everybody else substitutes that into the formula while I'm writing. So that gives 52 and 54. So then um, all these examples can be easily generalized into, uh, say, m times CP2 connected sum with m times CP2 bar. So in that case, you get um, 26 plus 31m minus 5n. That's a kind of more general case generalizing some of this. And uh, here you get 27 plus 33 times m minus 6n. And maybe I'll give you one more. So suppose you have, say, CP1 or two sphere times a surface of uh, genus G with n, um, with n uh, punctures or n, n holes. So uh, holes are OK. This is an example of non-compact four manifold. So a hole here will have a boundary as one cross a two sphere. And we can glue along them if we, if we prefer. So then you find that. The answer is 2g plus 4 and plus 1. And here it's going to be 6 and plus 1. So the reason I'm giving you this last example, well, there are several reasons. One, we'll come back to it a bit later. But uh, it also does not agree with that general formula. So. But it doesn't agree even if n is equal to 0. Um, right, so uh, in fact, this uh, probably I have to say that g is greater than 0. So uh, as usual, chi, chi of this sigma has to be positive. Uh, so that was used as, as assumption. But even then, it doesn't agree with that. And the reason is that um, it's not a generic manifold. It's, uh, it has very special holonomy. It's a product of the two. So you have to revisit this derivation. And, um, um, uh, but that's also OK, because as Misha pointed out, so, uh, so in uh, this derivation, or th this case, applies when chi of sigma is greater than 0. So you have to either have lots of Mach punctures, or, or genus greater than 1. Yeah. Sorry, chi, chi less than 0, chi, chi of sigma. So in all of these cases, uh, you can try to derive uh, what is the full uh, T of M4. So you can first find this 2D uh, CFT T of M4. And then try to ask, uh, so there are two questions you can ask. And then you can ask about Kuko homology, which is this vertex algebra VOA of M4. So is it true that uh, the information about T of M4 is completely encoded in just two vertex algebras, such as one of them has not been received? I don't think so, no. Uh, this is how you presented it. Yeah, so I, right, so that, that's why I didn't want to write on a board that it just left part. So you're absolutely right. That's a good question. And um, yeah, it, it, in general, it's not. I mean, it's exactly just have a problem with the left and the right one. Yeah, that's a good point. OK. But then, just repeat again, the uh, manifolds uh, which are not satisfy such formula which has matrix, which has matrix with uh, reducible volume. Yeah, so the, right, so the derivation of, of this, which again you can look up in uh, this paper, for example, or some of its references, assumes that uh, holonomy is generic, so you're on a general manifold. And it gives you a recipe what to, how to, I mean, what to be careful about when it's a, sp a kind of uh, special holonomy. So in fact, many of these examples I gave are actually a very special holonomy, except for the four sphere. So this is Keller. Uh, well, this is not Keller, but its holonomy is still uh, in a, by reversal of orientation related to this. S2 cross S2 is also not generic. So in fact, um, here, all of these examples have to be revisited, or many of them, carefully because of my remark. But only one of them gives something that's really different. So nevertheless, this naive formula works for, for many of them, even, even with this more careful analysis. 
but, so. but, but you like could, could, could choose an, an as a matrix uh, in hands metric on, on, on the spaces and uh, you will get gen general um Yes, on, on any of them you can, of course, modify the metric, but unfortunately the way this works is that if space admits a metric of special reduced holomela can be made killer, um, then you have to worry. So then, then there is a subtlety potentially. So in some sense, generic case is better, but anyway, it's, it's typical. Perturbations are usually better. So it's not whether it admits perturbation, but whether we have to worry when it admits something special. So, um, so question is, what are the corresponding, so there are two questions. One is, what is the corresponding CFT and what is the corresponding vertex algebra? Both are interesting and uh, they both have been answered in various classes of examples. So I'll, I'll just, again, play with a couple of them and leave you to more examples in, in this uh, paper with Boris that maybe not the state of the art, but still uh, tries to summarize much of what's known up to present. <coughs> and uh, one class of examples is, goes by the name uh, BPS, or can be a starting point for many of examples, is BPS CFT correspondence, or AGT correspondence, or NEGOT correspondence. And uh, you can add uh, your favorite sponsor here to uh, <laughs> So the statement of this correspondence is that when four manifold uh, is the most boring one, it's, it's basically R4, or you can think of it as a complex two-plane, C2. <coughs> um, that's also for topology purposes, same as four-dimensional disk or zero handle, uh, if you're really aiming to, to build something more interesting. Uh, but you view it uh, equivariantly with respect to, to uh, you uh, want groups or C star actions which are rotating this complex coordinates by a phase. So, natural way to represent uh, such two dimensional complex space is um, skeleton consisting of two fixed lines uh, which individually are fixed by, by the circle actions. So, I have the youngest uh, member of the audience now. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so these two directions, um, AGT correspondence basically says, so independently of any of these compactifications that we discussed today, AGT was uh, approaching this from a completely different point of view, and um, they found that um, instanton or equivariant instanton counting, or Necrosa found that equivariant instanton counting on C2 with epsilon parameters epsilon 1, epsilon 2 has something to do in general with W algebras, but in this case uh, Vera Sora with parameters uh, such that what uh, Misha called B and 1 over B are in some sense related to, to these two choices of axis. So one is going to be B, the other is 1 over B, and um, I'll represent this by saying that Verasora, with such parameter B, is basically uh, going to be um, intersection or, or C2, but I'll, I'll remember the C2 by specifying these two lines, uh, which are fixed individually by either first U1 or second U1. So that will be the general picture where, again, each line should have to be thought as um, carrying either B or 1 over B. Um, the central charge, which for us will be left central charge, so again, Kuko homology will give us less sector, so I'll write just C left, for Verasora is given by the standard formula, so it's 1 plus 6, um, and then B plus 1 over B squared, that's the continuous parameter that Sasha has in mind. Uh, and I'm also, so of course you can also write this as uh, 13 plus uh, 6 B squared plus B minus 2, but I'm going to introduce another notation which will be slightly more convenient and replace B squared by alpha, and um, then this will be 1 over alpha. So alpha is yet another way to parameterize this family of conformal field theories. So you could say that... Can you make the case that alpha plus 1 over alpha is the signature? 
Uh, yes, it, it could be very, yeah, you, if you do some subtle mumbo jumbo uh, using a variant version, yeah, so you can, but that's, yeah, that, it, it, yeah that's very funny in, indeed. I, I agree. So. And how does it arrive, the algebra? Right, so that, that's in part why I'm presenting this right sector that. Uh, um, to, to emphasize that it shouldn't be, uh, I mean, that, that if, if you're really bored with just vertex algebras, then there is indeed a full CFT which contains left and right. And it's meaningful to ask, what is the right sector for AGT? And uh, you can actually try to analyze that. And what you find is that it's a super symmetric, so 0, 0,2 version of Liouville theory. So. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know. That's a good question. It's uh, um, yeah. Uh, so there are some examples where this both sectors left and right have been studied. I, I'll give you another example, perhaps after the break, uh, and then switch to another subject where um, both sectors are extremely well known. In this case that I'm going to do next, uh, or present now, it, it's, it's mostly that the left sector is known, but not the right sector. Yeah, but the thing is, the left sector is theoretical and really taught from studying some kind of principle modules. It is a kind of geometry associated to M4, right. which knows something about this right. I would have to think how to formulate geometrically this uh, right sector. I, I don't know. I, uh, like I say, I'm, I'm completely honest. But anyway, in this case, it is m equal to zero in the right. Yes, it's a, it's a, in this case, it's it's known. It's basically n equals zero comma two Liouville theory, uh, which is on the right gives supersymmetric completion of this Liouville. So it's it's pretty simple theory. Yeah. And, and, and if you group is not the C two, but oh, then um, some guess would be that it's kind of zero. I, I don't know. That's yeah. That's a, that's a great question. So. Uh, I'm glad that such questions appear because that's indeed part of the reason why I present the right sector to for us well, to think about. That's uh, that's true. Exactly. If you think about moduli spaces, uh, like we discussed last time, there are only a handful of examples we can really do. So the goal here is that we can try to do more, and the way to do more is now to um, say that um, we can. Actually, draw. So what, what's what's written here? In fact, uh, so if you think about it this way, this is basically a toric skeleton. So now I'm going to label my various orders by alpha. It's a toric skeleton of C2. So now I can try to uh, start cutting them and gluing, and um, um, try to produce more general algebras just from this basic building block and uh, technique. Um, or a one technique, so Boris taught me that there are basically two ways of gluing algebras. It's either Boris T reduction or extensions. So you can try either one, and extensions will be more relevant here. So <clears throat> what you can try to do now is to consider patches of your four manifold which look like uh, a C2 or four dimensional disk and glue them uh, such that every such corner becomes a corner of the toric diagram. For instance, Right, even for non-compact manifolds, are related. C right is C left plus something. Uh, yes, but it's a little bit more delicate uh, because that's precisely the same question Sasha was asking. How can I justify that? Uh, so he recognized quickly that this is in general formula is the signature. So he asked me, how do I justify that this is some equivariant signature? That's what it really has to be. And uh, yeah, there is a way to do it, but it's subtle, and I'm not sure how much I trust it anyway. But uh, yeah, there is a way to do it, even for non-compact ones. For a presentation, do we assume that the comment of the presentation on the left and the right sector are related? Uh, so here, in again, my, most of the examples that I'll discuss today, what happens is that um, this the left and right don't really talk much to each other. For example, when you take cuckoo homology, you get just a ground state on the right, and that's why the left. VOA and what we call VOA FM4, given by cucumology, they're just the same. So they don't really talk in any interesting way. No, but the usual cucumology theory, left and right, 
sector are talking with each other? It depends. It, it depends how, what's, what's the pairing. So that's the data of the pairing. And if it's non-trivial, then, then of course they're talking a lot or little. I don't know. Yeah. Well, some combination of primary fields, uh, left and right sector, play a role in usual conformal theory. Because uh, if you determine fields, you have yes. to do it. Yes. But here are the same story. Here, here, here are the same story. And um, yeah, in general, I think it's a, it's a very good question. So that's basically the same as Sasha is asking. And I think it would be extremely interesting to work out this both left and right. Uh, and then including the pairing. Uh, again, I'll, I'll give you one class of examples where it's completely known. but. It's not the class where I'm heading now, so where I'm heading is a class of uh, toric manifold. No, not mathematical procedure, but there is a yeah, physical procedure. No, no, there, there is a um, no, no, no. I mean, there, there is a physical procedure which gave, for example, this general formula for central charges. And again, there is more, as Boris is saying. So, this physical procedure it's actually is a machinery which gives something, and in many cases can determine for you the full CFT. So, this this full T of M4. And uh, I don't know actually mathematical derivation of this general formula. So I'm, I'm sure there must be one one day from moduli spaces and so on. But uh, that's that's uh, so the central charge is an easy benefit that physics gives you uh, almost for free. It's it's one of the simplest facts. If, if, if you're talking about the left one, if you're dealing with some, I'm saying that it's supposed to be related to some moduli spaces. So can you deduce the form of the central charge from there? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm telling you. That in general, um, I. Yeah, for, Absolutely not. And, and my point is that, as we discuss very carefully in the paper with Boris, that you don't even know uh, what, is, what are the right moduli spaces. Because you use instanton moduli spaces, and the problem localizes to instanton moduli space only in really special cases when some vanishing theorems hold. In general, this has to be, uh, this VOA I, I raised, it has to be acting not on cohomology of some moduli spaces, but on fluor homology. Again, that's the, we explain it in detail. It's it's very complicated gadget. So I have no idea how, from from that perspective, get this formula for C left and C right. Absolutely not. And so, in principle, everything here depends on some AD in the diagram, right? Correct. But can you actually make it depend? I mean, so you're saying that, for example, you can do example for SC two, but can you actually associate the same thing to U one? Um, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, in that case, what you find is it's uh, so this. Um, vertex algebra is going to be basically lattice algebra based on uh, cohomology lattice of your four manifold, including H1, H3, and H2. H2 is most interesting. But what will happen is that there is um, self dual part of, uh, and uh, anti self dual part of H2, and they'll become left and right sectors. So they're going to split, in fact. So, in this, so if your manifold is definite, then, for example, everything will be on the left sector. But if it's non definite, that's precisely an interesting case when they start talking to each other. So that's, that's, that's a good example. So it makes sense even for you one. Um, I, I could. Um, somehow I chose one path. Uh, I mean, my time is limited. And uh, it, it's a good class, actually. It's very educational. I, I don't want to discourage people from looking at it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be analyzed to excruciating detail. And uh, in that case, that's one class of examples when you can write full 2D CFT and full uh, VOA of M4 for, for in gen complete generality. Um, just yeah. No, no, but it's uh, yeah, th th that's right. Yeah, it's uh, it it again. It's 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 actually easy to answer that, and it's uh, um, fairly concrete. Uh, so there is indeed uh, very simple zero to legal type theory that uh, we can describe, and um, that that provides the answer. It's it, it's really simple. But anyway, I refer then to to the paper for for those examples. So here I was going to consider just simple example of toric manifolds because I wanted to make contact with Misha's lectures, and um, CP2 is toric, so it consists of three such patches. So here, 
here and here are glued together. And uh, as Misha explained in his lectures, when we make <coughs> extensions of two Virasoro algebras or make such gluings, so we basically have two legs of Virasoro. So Virasoro represents such picture. So they have legs, say, alpha 1 and 1 over alpha 1. And you glue it to another one, which has legs alpha 2 and 1 over alpha 2. And when you do the gluing, you have to ensure that alpha 1 plus 1 over alpha 2 is integer number. So this integer number is required for nice extension of these two algebras. But uh, it has a clear geometric meaning. So if I give this number a name, say call it A, then what it's going to represent, it's going to represent uh, self-intersection of a line. So in a toric diagram, each of these lines now corresponds to CP1. And CP1 in four dimensions uh, has normal bundle, which is also two real dimensional. And A, this par integer parameter, is basically earlier number of that normal bundle, or equivalently self-intersection of that cycle in a four manifold. So CP1 is constructed in such a way where all these numbers are equal plus one. So plus one, plus one, and plus one. And basically what I'm saying is that for CP2, what you have to do is to take this three copies of Virasoro. So you take Virasoro alpha 1, Virasoro alpha 2, Virasoro alpha 3, and require that um, alpha 1 plus 1 over alpha 2 is equal to plus 1. Alpha 2 plus 1 over alpha 3 is equal to plus 1 and alpha 3 plus 1 over alpha 1 is equal to plus 1. Okay. So if you do this exercise and just add three central charges, of course you get back, uh, so from summing them together, so but upon extension central charges are additive, so if you sum them up, you get uh, C left equals to 57, just as we have in a table. Okay. Now you can start play, playing fun games, so that kind of works. And again, if you're interested in computing some cohomologies of moduli spaces, you can work just on CP2 individually. It will require a long journey to, to explore it. But uh, you can continue this game and in one second change these numbers to minus one. So then what you achieved is basically uh, constructing CP2 bar. So that will be the same with minus ones. So then. I change signs here, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and we get the corresponding answer, which is 21, because it's uh, 3 times 13 minus uh, 3 times 6. So that's, that's going to be your 21. And uh, now you can actually start building completely general toric manifolds, compact or non-compact. So. Yeah, so in this case, uh, right, so upon gluing procedure, uh, so here gluing is done via extension. Uh, the slogan is, in this class of examples, gluing equals extensions of EOA. And central charges are additive upon such operation. So uh, in particular, I'm trying to verify that indeed if I take uh, just basic building block and glue it, I get the correct central charge. And then the claim, of course, that you also get the correct vertex algebra. But this allows you to construct lots of uh, general manifolds, which usually go by the name of uh, Hirzebruch and G, where you can, for example, take uh, one patch of C2. So remember that. It, its toric diagram consists of two lines fixed by action of the torus. And um, you can now compose them together. And each time you have a line between two vertices, you create a new two cycle in the, in the four manifold. So for example, this element is now a two cycle 
and it has its own self-intersection. You can just say A1 here. This corresponds to a two-cycle, A2, and so on, up to, you can repeat this process many, many times, and up to, say, An. Okay. Now it's clear what to do. You basically take this various oral algebras and extend them multiple times. And what's going to happen is <coughs> this uh, relation between next adjacent alphas of two various auras will give you a continued fraction expansion of one alpha in terms of first alpha in terms of the last one. So this diagram is still labeled by uh, alpha one and 1 over alpha n, and if you ask how they're related, they're going to be related by continued fraction involving these parts a n, which are integers, so a i's are integers, and represent self-intersections of those cycles that you created. So I'm going to let you go and have tea, but before I do that, I want to give this new diagram, this diagram a new name. I want to say that the same representation of a four-manifold which we built out of patches of R4 or four-dimensional D score C2 is, uh, can be represented by so-called plumbing graph because in general, of course, manifolds are not toric and we want some more general representation of them. So this is a simple example where this plumbing graph <coughs> is basically the dual graph to what we just did. So it consists of vertices associated to two cycles. And these vertices are uh, these uh, dots labeled by A1, A2, A3, and so on, up to An. <coughs> and um, they're connected by edges whenever they intersect. So here, uh, this two cycle was intersecting the next two cycle only once. In, in this point, and every time such intersection happens, we draw edge between two vertices. So this is called plumbing graph. And uh, from now on, you can try to ask, uh, OK, how do I generalize uh, this class of manifolds to a much more general one, which is, I don't know, given by a tree or something with loops? So uh, let's stop for now, and uh, I'll give you a couple more examples uh, after the break.